appreciate it, Bradley. Praise the Lord. Well, if you're a guest with us today, my name is Todd Pope. I'm the lead pastor here. Uh, we're glad that you chose to join us on this holiday weekend. Uh, last week, Pastor Tyler, our campus pastor, we have a campus in Oconomowoc, uh, and so he started off this Kryptonite series uh, by telling us how worth it Jesus is, that he is worth the fight, he's worth the battle, he's worth the struggle. And today I want to look for the, I want us to look for the kryptonite in our lives, like it is worth it. And so before we can look for kryptonite, we have to know, like we have to know what it is. We've got to know what it looks like. And so I found some. <laughs> so, you know, just in case you've never seen kryptonite before, uh, I wanted to show you what it, what it looks like. Now, in Superman's life, kryptonite was the remnants of his old world, pieces of krypton. Uh, the, the planet that he was from. And when he got to Earth, one of the things that it took him a while to discover uh, why he was so strong, but it was our sun that actually gives Superman his supernatural strength and abilities. Uh, the radioactive debris from Krypton, again, kryptonite, uh, because of its radioactivity, because of its toxicity, uh, it and it alone would weaken and drain Superman of his strength. So it's incredibly important for Superman to know when there's kryptonite near him. Uh, it's very important so that he can get away from it. And so for you and for me, it's very important. Like we are children of a supernatural God. And it's very important that we understand and that we know what our kryptonite is so that we can stay away from it. So today's message is really about how to identify your kryptonite. See, the thing that weakens us spiritually, that makes us vulnerable spiritually, is our kryptonite. And it can be difficult to pinpoint what that is in our life. Because my kryptonite can look very different from yours, and yours can look very different from your neighbors and from everybody else. However, while the kryptonite itself might look different, the results are the same. A weakened, ineffective faith. It's critical that we identify and destroy the kryptonite in our life so that we can be strong. Now, this series was inspired by a book by John Bevere called Killing Kryptonite. It's a fantastic book. I, I strongly encourage you to pick it up. Uh, but in the book, he identifies kryptonite as known sin, something that you know is sin, and yet you stay in it and you practice it and basically say, I'm on the throne, you're not, and so it doesn't matter what you say, I'm going to do it. That's our kryptonite. Specifically, there is, he, he identifies that as really idolatry, that we've placed ourselves on the throne above God. So putting something, putting anything else on the throne of your heart instead of, or this is what happens most of the time, alongside God, putting anything else on the throne, that is idolatry. In the book, he tells a story that they, it, they had ended up making into a video that I'm going to show you this morning. It's a story of Justin and Angela. Check this video out. That castle. Really? Isn't that phenomenal? So they taught you how to fold the napkins? Yes. Oh, wow. I actually, believe it or not, I know how to sew, fold the uh, Sydney Opera House. I don't believe you. No, no, I really do. I, I, I can totally show you. Hang Stop. On, I'm, I'm very excited. Oh, good evening. Oh, good evening. Have you... Um, Dined dine with us before? Yes, actually, this is our favorite restaurant. W welcome back. Oh, no, babe, I'm pretty sure we've never been here before. No, that's weird. Really? Um, yeah, no, no, we haven't. Hmm. Oh, hold that thought just one second. I'm really, oh, yeah. no, really sure. sorry. Oh, no problem. Sure. Yeah. So, what would you like to order this? Oh, uh, yes, sir. So, you know what? I think I would like to have that salmon. That, that sounds absolutely wonderful. Yeah. That's one of my favorites. Oh, great. Yeah, really like that. And for you, ma'am? Oh, um, I will have the filet mignon and the New York strip and the eight ounce sirloin, all medium rare, please. Yes, fantastic. That is a great choice. <laughs> Thank you. I will get those right out to you. Babe, that's, that's kind of a lot of food, isn't it? <laughs> I'm not just ordering for one, you know. Wait, are you, are you telling me that we're, are we expecting? Yeah, he'll be here soon. It's a boy? Oh my God. Yeah, of course. Oh my gosh, course. babe. Okay, uh, this has got to be. There one he of is the now. Wait, Hi. What? Oh, bonjour. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. Mm. 
<laughs> I ordered for you. Oh, thank you. You know me so well. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm sorry. Do you, do, do you two know each other? Do yeah, guys... he is my boyfriend from high school. Your, your boyfriend from, from high school? Babe, can I ask you what your old boyfriend's doing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, did I come at a bad time? No! Yeah. <laughs> I really don't see the problem here, Justin. Yeah, I really don't see the problem here. Okay, who are you? Honey, stop, you're embarrassing me. I just wanted us to have one nice night at our favorite restaurant. Okay, first of all, I've never been to this restaurant. And, and second, what is going on? Hey, babe, sorry I'm late. Did I miss anything? Okay, seriously? Hey, you, all right, you, you take your hand off her and you, what is going on? Just sit down. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Angela, is this, is this some kind of joke? Are you, are you actually seeing these guys? Justin, I've known these guys longer than I've known you. Wait, what? Are you seriously jealous right now? Jealous? Angela, in case you forgot, we're married. Okay, and we spend the majority of our time together. I'm, I love you more than any of my other boyfriends. That's why you'll always be my favorite. Your, your favorite? Is, is there anyone else I need to know about? Babe, is there a problem Hi. over here? Okay, really, the waiter? No, Dennis, we're All fine. right, seriously, no. Good, food will be right out. Uh, okay, uh, so Angela, much. Angela, all right. These guys need to go, and we need to talk. We're done. I cannot believe this. You are being so selfish. selfish. I... Why do you always have to make everything about you? You ruined our favorite restaurant. <sighs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Yeah, I've still never been to this restaurant. That's good. This is a video parable of a person who has said yes to Jesus but they maintain patterns and habits of sin in their lives that undermine and weaken their relationship with Jesus. They're married, but one of them has some other relationships. They're not fully committed. One doesn't have their heart fully in the relationship, and that kind of marriage doesn't work very well in Waukesha or in Oconomowoc. Welcome, Oconomowoc. Right? It doesn't work really well in any other place in the world, in fact. If we're going to give ourselves to marriage and to a relationship with someone else, we want to be fully loved in return. Isn't that true? And so that should lead us to ask ourselves this question. This is our bottom line for today. Who or what has your heart? Who or what has your heart? And we're going to come back to this parable of marriage as we go through the message today. Bevere says this in the book, A Christian whose loyalty is divided between God and the world is an adulterer. See, the video parable pictures our relationship with Christ like a marriage, and that's biblical. That is one of the primary illustrations given throughout Scripture of what a relationship with God is like. Probably because most people can relate to that. Even if you're single, you can relate to the idea of what that's like being married. And so God in Isaiah calls himself husband to Israel. In Exodus, Israel enters into a covenant relationship with God like a marriage. In Ezekiel, God calls Israel an adulterous wife. And in Hosea, God instructs a prophet to marry a prostitute for this reason. Hosea chapter 1, verse 2 gives the reason, God speaking, this will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. See, the things that make for a good marriage actually make for a great relationship with God. If you're going to have a good marriage, you need to have good communication. I think we can all agree with that. And so in a relationship with God, talking to God is what we call prayer. And listening to God is what we call reading his word. 
And then if you're going to have a good marriage, it's important that you have intimacy, that you're close to one another. And spiritually, we enter his presence with thanksgiving and we enter his courts with praise. And so by praise and worship, we develop a closeness. We develop an intimacy with God. Commitment and loyalty is very important in marriage. If you're going to have a great marriage, there needs to be a sense that you are committed to one another, that you are loyal to one another, that you have an undivided heart. And that is so true, again, spiritually. Who or what has your heart? If you were married to someone like Angela in our parable, how would that make you feel? I mean, after all, you're her favorite. Being the favorite among many instead of the only. Like God wants to be the only object of our worship, not one among many. He doesn't want to be one seat at the table of your life. He wants it to be you and him. He wants us to actually not to tolerate but to destroy the idols in our life, the things in our life that we would set up on the throne equal to or greater than him. Colossians 3.5 says, So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. Don't be greedy for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. So sin, particularly known sin, is kryptonite in our lives. You cannot be strong spiritually if there are things that are in your life, known sin, things that God declares as sin, and you know he declares it that. As long as you're content with practicing those things, You cannot be strong spiritually. It is absolutely cutting the legs out from your walk with God. It's kryptonite when we know what it is. And there is a specific foundational sin that is, I think, is the most problematic in our lives. And sometimes it's the hardest to detect. And that's what we're going to focus on today. And that is, again, idolatry. John Calvin said the human heart is a factory of idols. Like left to itself, it will automatically just create God after God after God. And I don't know about you, but when I look back in my relationship with Christ, I can think of multiple times in my life where I allowed other things to share, at least share the throne in my life, if not take over. And I, I've shared before a couple of those, one, one being golf, that I've allowed it to become too important in my life on two different occasions at least where I really felt God said, you've got to set that aside. You've got you to lay it down. And I laid it down for like two or three days. Hardest time. I'm just kidding. You're like, what is that? No, like for months at a time. And I just said, no, I'm not going to pick it up. And then God released me to pick it back up again when I could put it in its right place. Because there's nothing sinful about golf. It was just in the wrong seat in my life. When Michelle and I were dating, there was a time in our relationship where I allowed her to sit on that throne. She didn't ask for that. Let's be clear. She had nothing to do with that. I put her there. And she broke up with me. Can you believe that? (laughs) (laughs) She broke up with me. And literally, and I've shared this before, but I, I went home and I'm in the bathroom and I had one of those moments with a mirror. Have you ever had a moment with a mirror? You know, you're looking into your, in your eyes and you're actually expecting to see into your soul. You know, and I'm looking there and I'm like, what in the world has just happened? And I was wearing suspenders, don't judge me. <laughs> they were very stylish. And there was a pin on my suspender that says, my heart belongs to Jesus. And the light from above the mirror had caught it and went right into my eye. And literally in that very moment, the Holy Spirit says, no, it doesn't. Your heart belongs to Michelle. And literally, that was like a reset button. As soon as he spoke that to me, I'm like, you're right. And I laid it down. There's things that we have allowed. If you just think back, there's things that we've allowed to be in the wrong seat in our heart. And that's what makes it so deceiving. It can be good things. See, there are things that are not sin that can become sin for you. And again, hobbies, I mentioned that, but it could be golf, it could be fishing, it could be camping, it could be shopping. It could be your job. 
like your job's the most important thing in your life. You see your job as the provider for your life instead of God. It can be that. It could be your family. Jesus actually said about our relationship with our family that we are to hate them. Now, we also know he didn't mean hate isn't like, I hate you. He meant hate as far as in comparison to our love for God, that our love for God has to be higher. The greatest gift that you can give your family is to love God more, to not pull your energy or your strength from your family, but from him. You are the best lover of your family when you love him more. We could put our country in front of our relationship with God. We can put religion in front of our relationship with God. If your version of religion is more important than your relationship with God, guess what? It's an idol. See, anything we put before God in our lives becomes an idol. Anything can be the wrong thing when it comes before God. In fact, we'd say that anything is the wrong thing if it comes before God. See, whatever we love, like, trust, desire, or give our attention to, more than God becomes an idol. And an idol takes the place that God and God only deserves. God said, do not make idols for yourselves. What that says is, we're the ones that make idols. We're the ones that make them. And the idol's power lies within our heart. And that's why who or what has your heart is so critically important. And I think it's easiest to comprehend this idea with the illustration of marriage that we showed in the, in the parable. Because this is the truth. Idolatry is adultery. saying that I have a seat for you at the table, Jesus, along with my other boyfriends. That's idolatry. It's adultery. Giving our heart, getting our strength from someone outside our covenant relationship. See, now that we know idolatry is our kryptonite and anything that's more important than God is our idol, I want to share this passage of Scripture with you that I think will really lay that out. Earlier this year, we did a series on Moses called Average Mo, and then on Mother's Day, Michelle did a great job uh, sharing out of a story of Moses. And today, I want to share another story from the life of Moses that will help us discover God's thoughts on idolatry. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Exodus chapter 32. We'll get there in a moment. But I want to catch you up. I want to set the stage for you. And so in Exodus 19, God appears to Moses on Mount Sinai, and he gave him instructions, including the Ten Commandments, how to handle sexuality, how to administer justice, what festivals to celebrate, and a whole host of other things, which he proceeds to lay out for the people in chapters 20 through 23. Then in chapter 24, Israel accepts all these were the conditions for the Lord's covenant. Israel accepts the Lord's covenant. She says yes to the dress. Right? Israel says, yes. Says, I do. Exodus 24, 3 says, Then Moses went down to the people and repeated all the instructions and regulations the Lord had given him. All the people answered with one voice, we do. We will do everything the Lord has commanded. Then later, in chapters 24 through 31, God calls Moses again up to Mount Sinai for an extended period of time. By the way, he goes up and down Mount Sinai about six or seven times. And in this time, it's an extended period of time, and he gives Moses the plans for worship going forward, including the tabernacle and all that entails, including the ark, the utensils, the clothing, the anointing oil, instructions for the Sabbath, and so much more. And then in the last verse of that section, verse, in chapter 31, God himself engraves the Ten Commandments, which he gave back in chapter 19 and 20, he engraves them onto two tablets of stone and cuts them out of the mountain and gives them to Moses. Then we come to chapter 32. So again, Moses had been on the mountain at this point for 40 days and 40 nights. Long time. Exodus 32, 1. When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said, make us some gods. Who can lead us? 
We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. Notice that phrase, make us some gods. The Hebrew word for gods in that verse is the word Elohim, God Almighty. The word's found slightly more than 2,600 times in the Old Testament. 2,250 times this word refers to God Almighty. For example, it appears 32 times alone in the first chapter of Genesis. The very first verse of the Bible includes this word, in the beginning, Elohim created. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Just over 250 times in the Old Testament, though, Elohim is used to depict a false god, such as Dagon or Baal. So we always have to read this word in context. Uh, our Bible helps us with that. It gives us a capital G if it's talking about Lord Almighty, and it gives us a little g if it's talking about a false god. So Aaron has the people bring their gold jewelry to him, and then he melts it down and he crafts a golden calf. And when the people see it, listen to what they declare. Hear this. Verse 4 and 5. Oh, Israel, these are the gods, Elohim. These are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. They're naming the calf God Almighty. They're saying, this is he who brought you out of Egypt. Aaron saw how excited the people were, so he built an altar in front of the calf. Then he announced, tomorrow will be a festival, not to Elohim. Tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. Yahweh. This is the personalized name that God Almighty gave himself when he said, I am Yahweh. I am the I am. So except in this one reference, the name Yahweh is never used for a false god anywhere in Scripture. This one place. So there's no mistaking what's going on here. Aaron and the people of God look right at this calf that Aaron's crafted. They look right at it, and they said, there is Jesus. There's Yahweh. This is our God. It's him. Having faith in a spirit that they couldn't see was too much for them. They wanted a God that they could see. And so they create an image to represent him in direct disobedience to a command that Moses had given them in Exodus chapter 20. You must not have any other God before me. You must not make for yourself an idol or an image. And here's the kicker. They don't call the calf Baal or Asherah or Dagon or Ra or any other Egyptian God's name. They fashioned an image that looked like what they wanted and then they called it God. This is Yahweh. Calling God by the right name doesn't mean you have the right view. They called God by the right name. They had no idea, and they weren't worshiping the true God, even though they got his name right. Look what they do next, verse 6. The people got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings and after this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. They declared, this is a feast day to Yahweh. He's the one that brought us out of Egypt, and so let's worship him. And so they bring offerings to him, and then they just let loose, and they party. They've convinced themselves that they're doing what their Yahweh is okay with. He's pleased with. They believe that he has no problems with their gluttony. The golden calf has not spoken anything about our gluttony. He doesn't care about our drunkenness, our sexual immorality. We can do whatever we want, and Yahweh says it's okay. They've entered the most deceptive form of idolatry that I think is the very hardest to identify, and that's this. They've created a knockoff Yahweh. You know what a knockoff is? Ever been to a border, the southern border of our country, or maybe you've gone to another country and you bought a Rolex. I call it a Folex, a fake Rolex. You bought a Rolex watch or you bought a coach purse and it 
just lasted until you got back to the States, maybe. I mean, it didn't last very long. It's a knockoff. It had the name right, sometimes. Sometimes it misspells the name, too. That's a different story. But it had the name right. It had the label right. But it wasn't the same in content. It wasn't the same in parts. See, we can get the name right, Christian. We can get the name right, Jesus. But if it's a different Jesus... What's God's response? Verse 7 and 8, the Lord told Moses, quick, go down the mountain. Your people whom you brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. How quickly they've turned away from the way that I commanded them to live. In essence, he was saying, I don't have their heart. They're cheating on me. And Moses returns to the camp. There's some accountability that takes place for Aaron and the leaders and the people. And then Moses declares, all of you who are on the Lord's side, Come here and join me. If I have your heart, come to me. And here's what we learn from the story, is we don't take sides with the Lord by simply saying, I do, by simply praying in prayer, by simply professing his name, by simply singing songs to him. We actually choose his side by choosing to live according to what he declares. That we are married to him. And it brings us to some really critically important questions we have to ask this morning. And this is it. Have we created a knockoff Jesus? The same in name, but very different from what the Bible describes. Do we have a grace dispenser Jesus? who winks at our sin and says, ah, don't worry about it. Here's some grace for that. Do whatever you want to. Here's some grace for that. My grace covers that. All right, here, do what you Have fun, you silly kids. Have another boyfriend. Have another girlfriend. Here's some, here's some grace for that. Do we have a hippie love Jesus? That all that matters is love. Why can't we just love one another? And he doesn't really care about anything else but love. All that matters is love. Do we have a look the other way, Jesus? Do we have a harsh, judgmental Jesus? Do we have a Jesus who allows, a, who allows us to do things that the New Testament clearly says we shouldn't and can't, but he allows us to because he knows what's in our heart? You can, you can live with that guy. You can... You can have sex with that girl. It's okay. Yes, I know my word clearly says you can't, but it's all right. Here's some more grace. You can live however you want as long as you come to church and worship me in name. Do you have a knockoff Jesus? Here's the truth, and this is what Pastor Tyler talked about last week. If you have a wrong view of Jesus you're not going to get a right relationship if you don't understand that it was my sin. It was the idols in my heart. It was my sin that caused him to have to die a cruel death on the cross so he could make the payment for that. That was Jesus saying, I do, saying, I love you this much. I'm going to the cross for you. See, unless we see God for who he is and what he deserves, we will always be seeking satisfaction outside of him. You can't resist creating idols in your factory unless you love the one true God. It comes from love. Let's go back to Justin and Angela and the illustration of marriage. Remember, idolatry is like adultery. Is the only evidence of our marriage... Our relationship with God is the only evidence to that, the fact that we said, I do. Right? There's a ring. Like, I said, I do to Jesus. I walked the aisle. I prayed a prayer. I said, I do. That's all that matters. In your marriage relationship, would that be all that matters? Should there be fruit to the fact that you said, I do? Should, there, should you actually live like you're married? How many of you 
if you're married, you want your spouse to act like they're married whether you're there or not. Anybody? I don't want to be the favorite among many, right? I want to be the only one that she loves. Is that selfish of me? No. Right, you've heard before that God's a jealous God, and maybe you've even thought, man, jealousy is such a negative attribute. How could you possibly be jealous? This does the best job. That video does the best job of explaining that. It's because you're created for a relationship with one. There's one throne. He doesn't share. He doesn't share. See, we don't stay faithful to our spouse simply because it's a rule. Simply because... We said we wouldn't, so we won't. No, we stay faithful best because we love. And if you love, you don't make room. You don't flirt with. You don't establish other relationships, not even emotional ones. There's a faithfulness because you love. And you act like you love them even when they're not in the room. Because, why? Because you love them. If we truly love our spouse, then we don't act like they're the favorite, but are only. Our marriage vows even say something like that, leaving all others, keeping yourself only unto her, only unto him, as long as we both shall live. So it comes back to this question, who or what has your heart? I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I in a real relationship with the real Jesus? Am I in a real relationship with the real Jesus? Do I love Jesus or am I just using Jesus for the benefits that he offers? Am I just using him because I want eternal life, because I want forgiveness of sin? Am I just, did I just say yes to the dress? Did I just say yes to the relationship because I want the benefits, but there's not really love? Such an important question. Jesus didn't die on the cross for us just to give us the benefits. Have you simply said yes, or I do? To Jesus, but you didn't leave all others and keep yourself only onto him. You kept part of your old life that drains you and weakens you. See, I think the truth is it's time to understand who you are, whose you are, and where you're from. And we got to stay away from our kryptonite. We have to stay away from our old life. Because here's the truth, you were created for greatness. God loves you with a deeper love than you've ever experienced from anyone else at any other time in your life. Like you can't even comprehend. Like him going to the cross is his love letter. It's a declaration of how much he loves you. And no one else, no one else has ever loved you like Jesus loves you. God loves you right where you are, but he loves you too much to leave you there. He loves you for you, and he wants what is absolutely best for you. Romans 5, 8, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we are still sinners. Galatians 2, 20, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 1 John 4, 9 and 10, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. See, God loves you. He said, I do, on the cross. What do you say to him? What do you say to him? Join my table. Join us at the table. You can have a seat among the many. Or is it, I do. One relationship. Jesus did not say, I am a way, a truth. You understand in this context why 
You know, people, a lot of people in our culture today are really offended by the gospel that Jesus said that he was the only way to get to God. When you understand it with this illustration, you say it makes perfect sense. He's not one way. We're not inviting, hey, you can get to this marriage any, with any of these other, no, there is one way. He's not one among many, he's the only. So God loves you, he said I do, will you say I do back. Will you leave all others and keep yourself only unto him? See, he didn't do that on the cross. He didn't go through all that so that you could visit him once a week or when it was convenient. He paid that price for you and for me because he wants to be the Lord of your life, to be in a committed relationship with you. I think too often we look like the people of God at the end of the book of Judges. Judges 21, 25 says, in those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. When we become the measure of all things that are truth, we've become God. We have no other king. We do what's right in our own eyes. That's not the way that the Bible describes a walk with God. We don't get to decide what is right and what is wrong. The word of God declares what is right and what is wrong, and we submit to that, we surrender to that, or we don't. Who or what? Has your heart. Every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. See, we say, I do. We take that step with Christ by faith. We turn away from all known sin. The Bible calls that repentance. We place our trust, our faith in Christ, in Jesus. We commit our lives to him. That's what it means to become a Christian. We turn away from all the other things and we turn fully to Christ and Christ alone. And our prayer team's gonna be up here this morning. I'm gonna be up here this morning. And if you wanna take that step, I wanna encourage that. But here's what I'd like you to picture this morning. I want you to picture this moment as a wedding. And Jesus is waiting for you at this altar. And if you're not ashamed of him, but you love him and you want to give him all of you, holding nothing back, then I want to challenge you to walk down the aisle and declare, I do. To say yes to Jesus. If you already have a relationship with Christ, in the next few moments, this is what I think this moment should look like for you. It should be, Holy Spirit, would you please reveal anything in my life that I've allowed to be more important than you? Holy Spirit, would you show me anything that I have placed in the wrong seat, that I have placed too high in my life? Holy Spirit, would you reveal that to me? God, would you search, search my heart? Let's do that this morning. Join me in standing all across this place. And these altars are open as we sing this song.